All right, welcome back. So where I left off before was this, the idea of a pitching imaginative education as this full human education and moving away from the word imagination. Now that is the natural end of this talk, but there is sort of this intriguing addendum that I'd like to suggest for the end of it. And it, it, it's involved with this question, where could this all take us? This reframing of imaginative education. So to just do a quick review of that, um, people have been used to presenting imaginative education, first starting by explaining the five cognitive toolkits and then explaining the specific cognitive tools and then explaining the idea, sort of working toward this idea of imagination as, I think, full human cognition. What I'm suggesting is sort of a bottoms-up approach to this, rather, that instead of talking imagination at the end, we start by talking emotions at the beginning, move from talking about the emotions and how everything uh, has within it the seeds of emotional engagement, the catchphrase for which, once again, is everything is interesting, move from emotions to talking about the specific tools, and then, as an optional point, move toward toolkits, again, the sort of a backwards methodology of talking about, i.e., imaginative education. Um, again, I'm making a switcheroo here between talking about imagination and instead talking about emotions. There's a lot of overlap here, but I don't want to pretend that they're exactly coterminous, and there may be some problems that come from that. But where could all of this take us? Now, I, I think there are some exciting things we could do with this. One is we could connect to brain science research, and two, we can address the dropout epidemic. First, to talk about the brain science research, when we, start to when we start talking about emotions, affect, systems one and two, we are now using these phrases, uh, these, these concepts, that mainstream educational psychology has some grasp on. Uh, some of these things you can actually see in a MRI, a brain scan. Uh, having a, a, talking this sort of language, using these sorts of concepts, allows us, I think, to connect with uh, the rest of the cognitive revolution going on in the rest of educational research and uh, science more generally, specifically in education. They might allow us to talk about two things that I think IE is really well p positioned to talk about, which is willpower and ADHD. The conversation that usually goes around uh, um, about those two topics is that uh, these two things, which are problems of system two, uh, lack of willpower and the having of ADHD, uh, problems in system two, the idea is generally that we need to beef up our system twos. But what if, what if we could say in the IE community, sure, we can beef up the system twos, but what about system one? Can we make a school, can we make curricula that really engage um, students' very uh, tendencies to be attracted to flashy, shiny things. Can we make, for example, a math curriculum so interesting, so deeply humanly interesting, that a kid with ADHD is going to ignore the other stimuluses in his or her environment in order to pay attention to the math curriculum? Um, we could pitch IE thus as making schools for systems one and two. I think this could be a very important move in educational theory. And the second idea that uh, using this brain science, this emotional aspect, may allow us to address the dropout epi epidemic. Well, why do people drop out of school, high school and, and junior college? I'm particularly thinking of here, though lots of other things too. Uh, certainly for a myriad of reasons. Uh, but one of the reasons uh, that, that scholars kick around uh, is the idea that school is boring. School is not intrinsically motivating for people. It's not interesting. Has anyone uh, heard, have you ever heard of the term supernormal stimuli before? You can think of it as a super stimulus, or the plural super stimuluses. This idea was first hatched, it's a crappy pun there, in I think the 1930s or 40s, uh, when a researcher named Nico Termbingen, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, uh, did some research on a little bird called the oyster catcher. The oyster catcher lays medium-sized eggs that have these sort of light uh, the splotchy patterns on them. Termingen discovered that when he would uh, uh, sort of nudge into the nest an egg that was bigger um, and an egg that had dark spot splotches on it, the birds would, uh, the birds which are led by their instincts prefer the slightly larger, more vividly splotched eggs, would ignore all of their real eggs and sit on this egg, which in, in this case actually happened to be wooden that the birds would forsake their own offspring in order to nurture this giant fake egg. So if these fake 
eggs were found in the natural environment, this would, of course, spell the doom of the oyster catcher. Thank God that they're not. Good thing that we don't have any super normal stimuli in our environment, right? If you're one who's given to nervous chuckling, now would be a fantastic time for nervous chuckling. Because, of course, we do. We're evolved for finding uh, sugar sweet on the ancestral environment. Of course, we have sugar popping up only every once in a while uh, in, in, in berries and such and such. Uh, but now we are surrounded by frappuccinos. In the ancestral environment, we are in, uh, evolved for and rewarded for making small, measurable progress toward goals. And now we are surrounded by angry birds. And in the ancestral environment, we're rewarded for finding interesting the stories of people around us so we might be better knit together into a larger community. And now we're surrounded by People Magazine and Justin Bieber. These are our supernormal stimuli. Uh, there's a book, The Race Between Education and Technology, by uh, Claudia Goldman and Lawrence Katz, famed economists. The idea of this book is that uh, technology is progressing and changing jobs in the, in the 21st century. The problem is going to be, can we get people educated enough in our schools to uh, have them be able to take these new jobs that are going to be uh, approaching, going to be coming? Um, what I like to talk about is, is taking this title and twisting it in a slightly different direction. We have coming, I suggest, and actually are in the middle of a race between education and the technology that brings a super normal stimuli. So, to again go back to the dropout situation, uh, you can imagine that education and uh, the media and the culture are competing for being interesting. And education has tools like textbooks and, and, and lectures, whereas everything else has alcohol and board games and drugs and ESPN and Netflix and pornography and video games and Wikipedia and so on and so on. Now, obviously, Obviously, none of those things are necessarily bad in and of themselves. Well, okay, board games. Um, but these things become bad when they uh, uh, trick students, when they grab students and take them away from the other things the students could be doing that would provide them long-term the most benefit. These, again, are our supernormal stimuli. So imaginative education using this understanding of emotions in System 1, might be able to bring into the educational conversation the idea that, all right, maybe we're stuck with some of these supernormal stimuli. Perhaps we're stuck with Frappuccinos. Perhaps we're stuck with Angry Birds. But maybe, just maybe, we can fashion a few supernormal stimuli of our own. Maybe we can make the school curriculum a supernormal stimulus itself. This might be one of the most important projects going forward in our society. And I think it's a project that a lot of people of various educational philosophies could be very excited to get on board with. So thank you very much for listening for this. Uh, again, the blog that I'm posting all this to is schoolforhumans.org. A few closing questions for all of this. What's lost in this elevator pitch, which, once again, um, replaces the usual term imagination, which does a lot of the weightlifting in a traditional IE pitch, and replaces it with emotions. Now, there are some things that come from that that we can't talk about otherwise. Attention, we can talk about willpower, we can talk about ADHD, we can talk about supernormal stimuli, but there are other things I strongly suspect that we can't talk about. What are those things? What is lost in this? Also, oh, there we go, that's that same question. What isn't clear about any of this presentation that I've given? Please um, uh, join the conversation and talk about that. How do you explain IE? What's your elevator pitch? How should we use the term imagination? And, and how can we make this better? And finally, finally, what, can an, what could an entire school of imaginative education look like? This is the primary project that we are trying to tackle at this blog. We're opening a school, a first grade in 2016, and we'd love, love to get your thoughts and advice on this. Thank you very, very much for listening.